I give up. The more I talk about it, the more I think about it, I love this book. I think I love it. Oh, I need to quit it, I need to quit it. He's driving me nuts. Are we focused? Focus. Hello, my bookish friends. Welcome, welcome back. I'm Elizabeth. This is Reading Riley, where we like to read Riley, not take ourselves too seriously, and have some fun with books. How are you doing? Let's chit chat. You wanna hang out for a little bit? Wanna hang out? Okay. So today, I'm doing something a little bit different. I'm gonna be having some fun with some books in a themed type of way. I was watching Noelle Gallagher's channel the other day and I saw that she did a kind of mashup with Jack Edwards, who apparently is a huge booktuber that I'd never heard of. So that took me down a rabbit hole. I started watching some of his videos and he did this video that was like this dark academia with music and books and activities and it was very themed and fun. And so I thought, well, why don't I do that with vintage retro housewife 1950s type thing so that's what we're doing so thanks jack i'm gonna be trying to read three books this weekend here's what i'm reading i'm not getting them till tomorrow so i ordered them on amazon and now they're running late which is kind of a bummer but i think uh if i get the audiobook i can kind of start and check in with you guys i might put my hair in curlers tomorrow i might wear a different outfit i might try to try to do a different look with my hair i might serve breakfast to my husband i don't know i guess i'm lucky because my house is a wreck so i'm definitely going to be doing some cleaning like a housewife so i chose three books from the 1950s to read these are going to be off my classics want to read list anyway so we're killing two birds with one stone and we have in no particular order lolita by vladimir nobikov i'm gonna read the catcher in the rye by jd salinger and i'm also going to read on the road by jack kerouac i'll try to throw some other stuff in along the way i'm gonna play dress up by myself and pretend it's not covid So I've gotten a little distracted. It's the next day. I really didn't get much done last night. Now I have to clean my house. I have about 100 pages left of The Catcher in the Rye. And gosh, I'm not even sure how I feel about this. What I most remember going into this is that this is what inspired the guy that killed John Lennon. What was his name? Oh, I can't remember. There is not a whole lot of plot going on. This is very, very character driven. Holden Caulfield, he's driving me nuts. I keep forgetting that he's 16. And I have to remember that how angsty I was when I was 16. But it is, all in all, very relatable. You relate to Holden very much, but at the same time, it's really hard to listen to him call people phonies and corny and just hate on every single person and not give them a chance. He hates people for being what he calls phony. He seems like he's really smart. He talks about how he's illiterate, but then how he reads so much. So he's not illiterate, but he, lies he, and he admits himself that he lies. I don't really know how I feel about this but I'm happy I'm reading it and I am excited to see how this ends. Also today I'm gonna do some more cleaning and I put my hair in these curlers. They've been in here for I don't know like three or four hours now but I know my hair is still wet underneath but let me just do my bangs give you a little sneak peek because I know I think this one's dry. Oh, 
Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. It's so girly. So I'm gonna have some fun with this. <gasps> How cute! Yes, queen. Yes. Mm. Mm. There's that. I'm gonna keep reading and try to keep updating you guys and we'll go from there. Okay, I can't wait anymore. I don't know if they're all dry or not, but I need to see what's happening in these. Oh. Okay. Oh my gosh. Oh my god, it's so pearly. What happens when I brush that? This is my daughter's frozen brush, so don't mind that. I wonder if I can get it to do like a finger wave type deal. That was bad. That was bad. Okay, I'm stuck. I don't know what to do now. Ooh, now I just look crazy. Every time I've seen people do finger waves, they always just keep brushing it and then it just pops out. How does that work? I give up. I don't know what's happening. You know what? I could do like a Lucy type deal. I think that's about as close as I'm gonna get for my Lucy look. No. I guess that's it. I am now Lucy. Mm. Oh. 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 I have no idea what I said in that last clip about the catcher in the rye because that was several, several days ago now. Um, okay, not that many, but like four days ago. I did not finish reading these books over the weekend. I got a little too caught up playing dress up, but you know, it made for fun times. And now I have finished this. I've also finished On the Road and I'm gonna save Lolita for another video. I didn't know what I was getting into with these classics, y'all. Oh my gosh. It's, it's not just, you can't just take these books at face value. You have to add in all of the extra information and all of the things that, all the context surrounding it and the culture of the times and, oh, oh my gosh, this isn't like a Jane Austen where you can just have fun with it. These are both heavy and at some points tedious but all around good books good novels both of these i personally preferred the catcher in the rye so let's start with that okay let's talk about holden caulfield initially i was very annoyed by holden and to some extent i still am but throughout this novel i was able to understand him on a deeper level and i really really appreciate that i really i actually i'm so glad i read this and i, I wish i had read it when i was a teenager because i feel like it would have meant so much more to me then i think a lot of people probably think that who have read this book but this is by jd salinger we're following holden caulfield and he is 16 and he's just gotten kicked out of the latest of several prep schools in Pennsylvania 
I don't know if they're all in Pennsylvania, but this one is. And we're basically following him on like a three day bender-ish, if not physically, mentally a bender. He's avoiding going back home to tell his parents that he's been kicked out of another school and so he's got some Christmas money saved up or birthday money or whatever and he's gonna go to New York and and hit the streets and kind of just pretend to be an adult. A lot of this novel is about that in between between child and adult and he is really smart and he's struggling with the idea of and the responsibility of becoming an adult and being dealing with the ramifications of being stuck in that middle space. He understands more than most 16 year olds about the world around him and therefore um, it's more distressing for him to live with on a day-to-day -day basis unfortunately. I think when we're kids we want to believe that everything will be roses and everything's gonna work out in your life and that fate will lead you to wherever it is you're supposed to be and you're gonna have this fulfilled life as a grown-up but he kind of sees the facade of everything of everyday life of everyday niceties he refuses to play in this game of life um and he thinks everything is phony he thinks every Anytime you're not absolutely authentic to your true self in the most sincere way, then you are phony. And he can't understand that and he won't acknowledge that that's kind of, I guess he does acknowledge because at one point he says, I said, how are you today to this guy or something like that. And he was like, and I didn't care, but you know, if you want to survive, you gotta, gotta say it. And it's true, you do. I think he struggles with that more than most kids his age. And it's almost like a not like every girl trope, or I guess not like every boy in this case, but it also is every boy. And that's the cool part about this. Oh my God, there's so much to say that I don't know. I don't want to drag on about this forever, but a main theme of this book is the outsider like you don't feel like you fit in you don't feel like you have a place in the world even in any kind of situation where i would personally feel like anxiety like oh i feel conflict coming he just thinks it's hilarious he's super pessimistic he constantly talks about being about how this is depressing and that made me depressed and he has kind of these catchphrases that he goes on and on with, like, oh, and that killed me. We thought something was funny, or phony, calling somebody a phony, or... But overall, he's very... I couldn't help but almost psychoanalyze all of these characters, a lot of these characters. He definitely, Holden, I felt like, is going through something. He's definitely having some kind of mental issues going on, and... Obviously, he says he's dealing with depression, but I also felt like at times he was having some kind of manic periods, so I don't want to diagnose him or anything, but there were things that suggested that to me, like when he was in the bathroom with um, Stradlitter, Stradlater, I don't know how to say his name, but, and he kept talking about how he just kept turning the water on and off and on and off and on and off, and he's like, I just had to. I just also in my head while I was reading this, I don't know why, but I gave these guys like 1920s news reporter voices. I don't know. And I was turning it on and I, I was turning it on and off. You hear? You hear? It was on and then it was off. And then I had to get up. I had I had to get up and go to old Stradlitter. And I had to. And he was just killing me. I don't know. That was my voice in my head. Oh my gosh. I want to go on so many tangents and I need to stay on topic. So anyway, he's turning the water on and off, and then he got up and did this kind of song and dance, and I got the feeling that it was like, he said he was just horsing around and, you know, just being silly, but I felt like he was having a little bit of a manic energy. And I also thought that his friend, 
Ackley, Robert Ackley, and I definitely felt like he was on the spectrum. Just throwing that out there as evidenced by his not picking up on social cues, that he would just be in his space in his room and he's trying to like say things like, oh, I don't really want you here, dude. Like, mm, you know, like being like subtly trying to be like, why are you in my room? Get out of here. And he just wasn't picking up on that. And then he said that he had like, Mo he always had mossy teeth. I think he used the word mossy, but it was like, oh, it was a really good descriptor actually. But he was like, no, I brush my teeth, I do. He said that he really didn't get things through to him until you yelled it at him. And just for me and some like personal experience that I've had in my life, I really got that on the spectrum vibe from him. The difference between Holden and Ackley is that Holden understands the social cues. He understands the the way the world is supposed to work. And even more so, he, he understands why why that is a thing, but he refuses to acknowledge it. Whereas Ackley, on the other hand, he doesn't pick up on that. So it's not really, like you can't blame him for that, but hold, for Holden, it's an absolute choice to disregard um, social niceties or social cues. It's something that he actively, consciously does. He's also very self-sabotaging. He knows how he's supposed to behave, but he, then does the opposite whether to entertain himself or just because he doesn't care i don't know so i got this vibe this goodwill hunting feels right so he like he's very smart but he says he's illiterate but he reads all of these books and he's kind of this on the separate plane or a different plane than most people are as far as his awareness and his the way he views the world um, but he's also this like asshole genius. As much as he is annoying throughout mostly the beginning of the book, we come to understand his true self. And that's one of the best things about J.D. Salinger's writing. Holden is kind of this unreliable narrator, right? Because he's admittedly a self-admitted liar and he's very prone to hyperbole. He's a walking contradiction. He's he says one thing and he does another. And that's one thing that I thought J.D. Salinger did really, really well in this book was to show, because it's in first person, past tense, he's telling you about this just after it all happened. He describes things, but then he thinks different things. It's hard to explain. It's like when you want an author to not tell you something, but to show you something, this is a really great example of that because you're, He's telling you his own story, but then he's showing you how Holden really feels and what's really truly in his heart. And when it comes down to it at his core, he is a good kid. And he, the people that he holds close to his heart, he's fiercely loyal and he wants to protect children from these things that he sees. He wants to, and that ends up being his kind of discovery. Oh, so also the way it's written, it's almost entirely anecdotal and it's written in this uh, almost like stream of conscious type of prose and I really thought J.D. Salinger did such a great job with that because it's almost like it's really hard to do to write like that because first of all it's a character, it's not yourself. So even in your own mind, it's hard to follow your own train of thought sometimes. If you were to sit and think about like, oh, I was just not talking for 10 minutes and what thoughts exactly passed through my brain? The only time I've been conscious of this was when I am trying to meditate. And then I'm very conscious of it. But yeah, he does such a good job of, so we don't notice that when we're, you know, we touch a piece of fabric and it reminds us of our foreign exchange student in second grade or you know you hear a car horn and you it reminds you of the time you threw up on the bus to a field trip you know or something like that and you don't even acknowledge it in your own head so it's so hard to catch those things and the way he navigates this in a way that is so effortless and nuanced is really well done and very successful and I just appreciated it I really 
I will say at times, like my at the beginning, especially my reading experience uh, was not 100% amazing. But as I went on with it, as I got to know Holden, and as I kind of researched the context of this, my reading experience skyrocketed. So I can't say, I mean, I really, really recommend this book. Oh, another thing was like with both of these stories and particularly this one, but in this one as well, there are things that are said and portrayed that would not be okay today. And if these were written today, neither one of these would fly at all. But I think it's really important to try to read these in the context of what they are, is that they were written in, well, I think both of them are actually written in the 40s and then published in the 50s. But that was one thing I really struggled with while reading both of these was being constantly pulled out of the story because of those things that were kind of triggering to my ears and my eyes as far as the language that they used or the kind of way they treated women. But it's all true to the times, but I, it's just, it was hard for me to appreciate something that includes that, I guess, if that's, I don't know. Both of these were such big undertakings. I can't believe I did not, I didn't think this through because I'm so, right now my, my head is full. Like my brain is full. And this one, I had to, I was forced to I read this and I planned on it anyway, but with the way things went last weekend, I just didn't end up having time. So I was like, well, I'll just finish the last, I only had like a hundred pages left. I'll finish it at work on audio. There's no audio book for this. There's, a ton of summaries and cliff notes, but I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to cheat. I wanted to read the book. So I also discovered that Salinger was very, he died at age 91 in 2010, I think. Um, he was so particular about his books and his rights, I think. The books, the copyright, I don't know how that, all of that businessy stuff works, but um, basically he, thought that the way everyone should experience this was in its true authentic form because he doesn't want to know phonies and he was very very strict with the, the copyright on this book and he would not release it to anyone for any kind of adaptation or anything that's why there is no movie of this that's why there is no audiobook of this yeah so i had to i read it and so that's kind of what slowed me down a little bit because i'm not a fast i reader and i once i got back to work after my long weekend i was just going 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 so, but anyway, finished it. The more I talk about it, the more I think about it, I love this book. I think I love it. I think I love this book. I don't understand why Mark Chap Chapman, well, the guy that shot Jen Lennon, and then there was a couple other guys that were, said they were inspired by this book to kill people, <sighs> which I think is bogus. Before I read this, I always kind of knew that, and I thought if you're seen with this, it's like you have to be incognito. You don't want anyone to think anything about you because you have this book. But now that I've read it, I'm like, well, that's stupid. If anything, they related to it because they felt like outsiders when this book is just a really, really gritty coming of age story. And also it is incredibly relatable and it captures this kind of teenage angst, for lack of a better word, in a way that is really hard to do. And I think that's why it's so respected and I get it. It's the next day yet again. My battery died last night and I was not able to get into On the Road by Jack Kerouac. Okay, so let's talk about it. This novel threw me for a bit of a loop. I have mixed feelings about it. I'm not going to lie. My reading experience throughout this was... No bueno. Yeah, I uh, I didn't really enjoy the reading experience. The way it's written is described as kind of a spontaneous prose. Jet Kerouac wrote this based on his real life experiences. In this novel, he, the character of him is Sal Paradise, and then his friend is Dean Moriarty, who in real life is his actual friend, 
Neil Cassidy. This book is exploring the beat generation. It's kind of like a post-war, post-World War II pre-hippie movement. So it's kind of like somewhere in between where they are romanticizing, it's hard to explain. It's kind of like, it's romanticizing this vagabond lifestyle and they are on the road as indicated by the title. And this whole idea encompasses the idea of kind of this Zen Buddha mindset, free love, very much like drugs and jazz and you know, everything just feeling in the moment, living in the moment, living for experiences, not, not giving in to the everyday expectations of normal life. It's basically the exact opposite of what is expected of you in this time where, you know, you graduate from school, you get a job, you get a wife and two and a half kids and a house with a white picket fence. This is like the exact opposite of that. It basically tells the story of Sal and Dean and they're just kind of off in the world. They are just traveling the United States. They start in New York, I think, or New Jersey. They go to San Francisco and then they go to, they go down to Texas and Louisiana and then back to New York and then Chicago and, back to San Francisco and just all over the place. They have no money. They are picking up little jobs wherever they can, trying to get prostitutes. I'm sorry, trying to get sex workers. See, now I'm doing it. And they didn't even say prostitutes, they said whores. Doing all the drugs they can. Oh, they go to Mexico too, towards the end of the book. And it's very much like, gave me like man's man vibes, like locker room talk type of stuff. But at the same time, there were aspects of this that I did really enjoy, like the jazz. They spent a lot of time in kind of sweaty, dark jazz bars where, and he describes the music in a way that is great, really great. I kind of connected with this in, on some level because I kind of did this to a small extent in my 20s. I just, I moved to Texas on a whim from Michigan and I, you know, barely had a job and lived without electricity and just basically was in the musician scene and the music life and didn't really know how I was gonna pay my rent from one day to the next. And I am glad I did that. I'm not doing that anymore. And now maybe it's just part of getting older and growing up, but, now the thought of that, of that living like that gives me so much anxiety. And maybe it's because I have that lived experience, but at the same time, the idea of not having a car or like having to steal a car, which I didn't do that, <laughs> but like, and not knowing how you're gonna get to your next place, being in some foreign place that you don't know, you don't know anybody and you have no money to buy food, you don't know when your next meal is gonna be. For them, it's so liberating and it's, and it's this sense of freedom that they had never thought that they could get. For me, it was just making me super anxious. But I will say about the music and all that, so they have this conversation about finding it and it originates when they're listening to this jazz band and <clears throat> Dean says, now nah, man, that Elton man last night had it. He held it once he found it. I've never seen a guy who could hold it so long. I wanted to know what it meant. Ah, well, Dean laughed. Now you're asking me, now you're asking me imponderables. So then they go on and they're like hitching a ride with this other two guys and they're in the back seat and the guys were, I guess, anxious about something, about needing to get on the road, needing to get there at a certain time. And so Dean says, now you just dig them in front. They have worries. They're counting the miles. They're thinking about where to sleep tonight, how much money for gas, the weather, how they'll get there. And all the time they'll get there anyway, you see, but they need to worry and betray time with urgencies, false and otherwise, purely anxious and whiny. Their souls really won't be at peace unless they can latch on to an established and proven worry and having once found it, they assume facial expressions to fit and go with it, which is, you see, unhappiness. And all the time, it all flies by them, and they know it too, and they, they, and that too worries them to no end, which I understand too. And I'm anxious, and I'm a worrier, and so like, now I'm like, okay, that triggered me a little bit. Like, okay, I see you calling me out. I don't know. It's just a, a choice for everybody, I guess. Um, 
And I do think it's it's important for us to have lived experiences. And of course, Sal in the story is a writer because Jack Kerouac is a writer. And so, you know, he's trying to get these lived experiences and, and to have something to write about, which he obviously found. And then Dean, a lot of this is about their kind of friendship and how they always, they they split up and then they somehow always wind up back together. But Dean, I've known so many Deans in my life. Like he is the super eccentric, um, just out there thinker. He's just very, I don't know what the word is. He's just, he's very extra, but he's this like pseudo intellectual or maybe actual intellectual hippie type guy who is just like, look at the world and trying to find meaning in everything. And he, at some point he like reads tarot cards to people or something and like tells fortunes and shit like that. And But he's your kind of quintessential like artist. Like when you think of like a an eccentric artist, although I don't know that he is an artist in this, but they get to the point where they're just like swapping wives and girlfriends and getting just getting crazy. Sal and takes a job as a policeman at one point, takes a job picking cotton in Mexico at one point. And overall, I understand the importance of this, of this work and how it kind of defines a culture. This was the start of the beat generation, which was a literary movement started by Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg and one other author. Oh, William S. Burroughs. The historical importance of this is heavy. It's she heavy. And I get that. Um, I just personally, I, I'm glad I read it. I will not probably read it again, but I'm glad that I have that insight. And I don't know how I would rate this. I really don't because a lot of my enjoyment in this came from afterwards kind of looking into it and learning about it and the context of it and how it you know sits in history and with that being said like i do think it's important to read but it's certainly not something that i would typically go for you it's clear that um hemingway is a huge influence for jack kerouac and i think that's also the same to be said for um salinger but I personally am not a Hemingway fan. Um, I took a I actually took a Hemingway class in college, um, very excited going into it. And then we read the first book. I think it was A Farewell to Arms or The Sun Also Rises. I'm not sure which one, but it became very clear to me very early on in the semester that it, I just wasn't a fan uh, of Hemingway. So it ended up being quite torturous if I'm telling the truth, but Hemingway is mentioned in both of these books, like actually mentioned by name. So clearly for this generation, Hemingway was, you know, their kind of predecessor, their, their influence. And I get that. I can see that in here. I think Hemingway said that good writing is something along the lines of like to the point and vigorous. And I'm definitely seeing that in this, in this kind of spontaneous prose style. You know how, so I'm an introvert and in order to, sorry, I just have my e -sick. In order to feel recharged for me, I have to be alone and have my alone time. And then I can kind of be around other people and like, and then that'll drain my battery back down. And then for extroverts, it's the opposite. When they're around people, it charges them up. And when they're by themselves, it starts to drain. For these guys, it felt like they had to be traveling. They had to be spontaneous and not know what their next move was. And that vulnerability and that kind of sense of exploration and sense of, you know, finding out what's on the next horizon is what charged their battery. That's the sense that I got from it. And that's great for them. Both of these guys lived really hard lives and they both died really young. I think Jack died at, I think, 47 and his friend Neil died at 41. Um, I think Jack had, had something to do with like a, oh God, I don't remember. He, he died in Florida and he's with some kind of hemorrhage or something weird in his stomach and his guts or something. And then his other friend, I think OD'd or something. I can't remember. I'm giving you terrible information at this point. But they both died really young. So like 
that's the thing is that this book is is romanticizing this lifestyle but at the same time it's bullshit it just it depends on your perspective do you want to live fast die young or do you want to have a nice long life and you know find your joy in other places um and i think there's probably a good middle ground for that too i really do but this is definitely on one of the far ends of the spectrum as far as that goes and it's almost dangerous to show this lifestyle in that kind of light but at the same time it would be just as dangerous not to if that makes any sense but yeah it's great it's beautiful and it's bullshit it's all the things all at the same time it just depends on your perspective i guess i don't i don't know but yeah that's uh, on the road by jack kerouac okay y'all that's all i have um that's gonna be this video i want to thank you if you are still watching i'm sorry it's been a little bit chaotic i swear i'm gonna get my shit together i swear i am i guess i, I really didn't know what i was getting into when i uh, lined up these classics and while i'm very glad that i read them i just didn't have the time that i wanted to put into this so that's why it's kind of dragged out i guess it doesn't feel like that for you i had a lot of fun dressing up playing the 50s housewife i could have taken it to another level and if you guys like that maybe i'll do it again or maybe i'll do like a different a different decade Ooh. That might be fun to like read through the decades. I could do like 60s next time and, do, and be all mod. Ooh, that might be fun. Ooh, this could be a series, y'all. If you're still here, thank you so much. Um, as always, I, I appreciate you, every single one of you. And let me know how you feel about these books. Have you read them? You probably should. I don't, I'm not saying that like it, they were easy reads, but you should probably read them. I feel better having read them. I feel like I'm more worldly in some way <laughs> and I have more experience. I'm so wise now. <laughs> but seriously, if you have thoughts about these, please let me know if your opinion is different than mine. That's totally fine. And we're not all gonna feel the same way about these, but thank you so much. I hope y'all have a wonderful rest of your day. And don't forget that life is short. So read Riley. Cheers.